high over Hollywood Boulevard. The plot, such as it is, concerns a bunch of extraterrestrials who, concerned by Earth's burgeoning nuclear capabilities, decide to execute the famous Plan 9, resurrecting the human dead and having them march on the world's capitals. In actual fact, in the movie, this grand scheme comes to very little because the only humans actually resurrected are the old man, played initially by Bela Lugosi, the uh, police detective, played by Tor Johnson, and the silent woman, who was played by a rather famous television horror hostess of the time, Vampira. You don't have any lines in the movie. Were you initially offered some? I was initially offered some lines. <laughs> I was initially offered some lines. But the fact is that the character, <clears throat> although I was billed as Vampira, the character wasn't Vampira as I had conceived her. Vampira as I had conceived her was giddy, uh, out outrageous. And this was a different kind of a, because she was in a trance. And I just thought it would be better if she were in a trance. And I asked her, please do it mutely. And they said, well, OK. What was the set like for Plan 9? Well, I would say, as with everything that Ed did, ingenuity reigned. We had, uh, for example, turf made from God knows what under paper grass, you know, that was had uh, swellings and hollows, and one had to be careful not to trip on them, right? And uh, cardboard tombstones and dried-off twigs that had been placed about it, thither and yon. It was the general uh, impression of a, of a graveyard, but it was done with uh, what I call spit and gum wrappers. Last night I saw a flying object that couldn't have possibly been from this planet. But I can't say a word. I'm muzzled by army brass. I can't even admit I saw the thing. Gregory Walcott's friendship with the film's financier, Ed Reynolds, got him a plum part in the film, that of the plane's pilot. Normally, when I do a scene, I like to go onto the set ahead of time to get a feel of it, feel the props and the space, and. And, uh, and uh, I said, Ed, where's the cockpit set? He said, well, they're building it. And uh, I kept looking, waiting for the cockpit to be delivered to the sound stage, a little dinky sound stage. And finally, a half hour before this cockpit scene was to be filmed, two carpenters brought on two pieces of masonite board and bent them into an arch and strung a shower curtain in the back and drug over a few pieces of the uh, uh, electronic uh, sets from the spaceship, and that that was the uh, the uh, cockpit. American Flight 812, this is Burbank Tower. If I were asleep, you'd never get on the ground. In your case, maybe I ought to leave you up there for good. Over. You got me that time, Mac. This is American Flight 812 requesting. <laughs> Tower to American Flight 812. My agent was furious when he discovered that I had done this, this, this planned grave robbers from out of space film. He was furious with me. He said, you've taken a giant step backwards in your career. Stop him, Tanner. He's close enough. Turn off your electro gun. No! Now, this was supposed to be a horror film. And in those moments where people or the audience, audience was supposed to gasp in horror, the kids would laugh and giggle, you know. And I knew right away the film was in terrible trouble because it was just so bad. Just so bad. Colonel Tom Edwards, in charge of saucer field activities, was to make the greatest decision of his career. He made that decision. Colonel Edwards gave the signal to fire. One of the film's most noted features is, of course, the not-so-special effects. There are a couple of scenes where it looks like there are actually two pie tins that are stapled together, and they went around with a string and just took this pie, these pie tins stapled together and tried to make a flying saucer out of it. And I talked to one of the guys who did the props. He said, no, we didn't have the budget for pie tins. We used paper plates. 
they took a paper plate, they doused it in kerosene, they took a little cigarette lighter and just somehow let it burn on fire, making it look like a burning flying saucer. And I think that's the magic of Woods films. One of the features that Ed Wood fans look forward to in his movies is the appearance of his repertory company, a bunch of like-minded stalwarts he'd gathered around himself. It's an odd collection of old stars like Bela Lugosi, minor television personalities like Vampira and Criswell, odd balls like Swedish wrestler Tor Johnson, and even a few personalities that Wood discovered himself. This is the astrologer Criswell, who opens Plan 9 with a mystic monologue. Greetings, my friends. We are all interested in the future, for that is where you and I are going to spend the rest of our lives. And remember, my friends, future events such as these will affect you in the future. He was colorful. I liked him. I liked Chriswell. I liked the whole assortment of, of people that Ed Wood had gathered around him. How do you think Ed did attract such a colorful group of people? He, he seemed to draw them from somewhere, didn't he? because he was an oddball. Birds of a feather flock together. <laughs> uh, they were kind of Ed's uh, menagerie, I called them. They consisted of ex-wives and astrologers and chiropractors and just kind of what would be considered fringe people. This is the story of those in the twilight time. Once human, now monsters, in a world between the living and the dead. Monsters to be pitied, monsters to be despised. Another of Ed's discoveries, Valda Hansen, was the star in his next film, Revenge of the Dead. He said, I'm looking for a girl with eyes like you and someone who can mesmerize and be the white ghost. So he had me read for him and he had me do a little skit of, um, oh, the Banshee, the Banshee. And he said, that's sensational, Valda. You are a good actress. Since Mrs. Wingate Yates Foster, through my benevolent society, wishes the arising of her dear departed husband, Wingate, we tonight will bring him from that which was thought to be his final resting place. are duping the people in these seances. And consequently, as time goes on, we draw the real, the real dead. And so that is why it is the night of the ghouls. And it ends up, they come after us. I've had friends, and I watch it on our VCRs, and they say, Valda, how do you make your fingers wiggle like that? They said, you should put that just that scene on a commercial, just those fingers. How do you make them wiggle? They look like they're doing the coochie coochie. <laughs> His next film was The Bride and the Beast. He wasn't in the director's chair this time, but his screenplay was so distinctive that it's unmistakably an Edward Jr. film. It tells the story of a beautiful young girl who marries an animal trainer, but discovers on their wedding night that she's much more attracted to the gorilla he keeps locked in the basement. Still with me? OK, well, rather upset about this strange desire, she quite naturally visits a psychiatrist who discovers, after some lengthy scenes of jungle stock footage, that she was once a gorilla herself in a past life. This explains not only her unhealthy obsession, but also her deep-rooted love of Angora sweaters. 